God's name. Distinguished guests, dear audience, welcome to the auditorium of Maastricht University. My name is Rianne Letschert, and I'm the Rector Magnificus of this very beautiful, very young university. And I have the honor to introduce to you our newly appointed professor, Professor Ott, who will in a few minutes share her vision on EU external relations law. Now that's also the name of this chair that she holds here, and from what I gather, is also the subject of the book that she's currently writing. She'll probably tell you all about it in a minute. But before I say anything about Professor Ott's career, I would like to dwell a little bit on another important woman in Dutch science. And her name is Johanna Westerdijk. And maybe not a name that is known to the entire audience, but I will exp explain a little bit. 2017 saw the century of her becoming the first Dutch woman to be a professor at Utrecht University. And her inauguration on February 10, 1917, marked an important moment in academic history. Now, unfortunately, the gender inequality within the academy wasn't history quite yet. And to this day, you see the percentage of women drop the higher up the academic career ladder you look. So it's still a little bit out of balance, I can say. While about half of all university students are female, among the professors we still make up less than a quarter. Also at this university, we are still below that quarter, I have to say. Now, in order to create more opportunities for female professors, the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science made funds available in 2017, so that's the year of the anniversary of Johanna Westerdijk, and they decided to appoint 100 female professors in the Dutch universities. Now, at our university, we could, based on this uh, initiative of the minister, appoint eight professors, and Professor Ott is one of them. And I want to be very clear, all these eight ladies that we appointed at Maastricht University would also have become professors without the Westerdijk funds. Their quality is beyond dispute. It did, however, enable us to open up these career opportunities a little bit sooner, and I'm very happy that we were able to do so. Now, dear Andrea, after your studies and PhD in your native Germany, you came to the Netherlands. And from 1998 to 2003, you worked as a senior research fellow in European law and international economic law at the Asser Institute in The Hague, where we also met. I was just telling a colleague who I met into the corridor that at that time I was a PhD and you were already uh, a senior or a researcher there. Right? So that's how things go, both now here in this beautiful Maastricht. You gained a lot of experience in legal consultancy for both national and international government bodies. But what really excited you was doing scientific research in this fascinating field. In 2003, after a year in Florence as a Jean Monnet Fellow at the prestigious European University Institute, you decided to come to Maastricht. And you have become a highly valued member of the academic staff, inside but also outside of your own faculty. You have a passion and a talent for education, as did also Johanna Westerdijk, I have to say. And you have taught in many countries, including Turkey, China and Thailand, on topics ranging from the fundamental characteristics of EU external relations law, such as external representation and competences, EU trade policy and EU-China trade relations. And closer to home, also students from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences know you as the coordinator of the European Institutions Block, a task that you also carry out with great dedication. In research too, you have a passion for EU external relations law, and you are regularly invited to speak on this topic. Very recently, you co-authored the national report of the Netherlands on the external dimension of EU policies for the prestigious Congress of the International Federation of European Law. Your scientific publications are characterized by a great love for detail, 
thorough analysis whether it concerns the relationship between the EU and Turkey or the treaties that the EU has concluded with other neighboring countries. Clearly, this is your thing. Now, in Dutch, because we don't have a real word for that, we have a beautiful word for this very thorough, detailed approach, which is Grundlichkeit. And that seems to be just one of the characteristics that show that there's still plenty of Heimat in you. Eh? Please keep that. It is that importing and integrating virtues from all, of the, all over the world, which also gives our university its international character. So please stay true to yourself in this. Your husband, Alex, with whom you have now settled in the beautiful Valkenburg, will certainly second that. I was told by some of my spies that in your spare time, you regularly take to the field with your woman, women's hockey team. Are you the coach, the leading uh, cheer lady there? <laughs> oh, you resigned. Too, ma too much work as a professor now. That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> dear Andrea, dear Alex, daughter Annika, and all of your friends and colleagues and family also present here, we very much also on behalf of the faculty board present here congratulate you on this very important career milestone. The motto of Johanna Westerdijk, I don't know if you've read about it uh, when you was appointed, was, and I really love it, werken en feesten vormt schone geesten. In English, that is working and partying make for a healthy spirit. So you should reconsider resigning from your hockey activities. It's good to do, to do both. Now you certainly have done the work, so I wish you also a very nice party later on. She was actually, when we walked here, already going into the reception uh, room uh, instead of going to the auditorium. So you first have to do some work. 45 minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, this is very honest to see so many colleagues uh, here at Maastricht University. My Frau Rector Magnificus, Meneer the Decan, Collegas, Friende, Familie. This inaugural lecture appears to address food. Unfortunately, I have to disappoint you. Um, today's topic covers third country integration into the European legal space. However, before you sink back into your chair and find this a tasteless and yeah, technical subject, Gründlichkeit, I try to convince you of the opposite more, or more modest, that it's actually a technical and important subject. Why is it important? namely for the following four reasons. It is highly topical, at the same time perpetual. It includes legal and political components shaping the EU and its relations to neighboring countries. The extension of the European Union rules and policies beyond its territory on th and in third countries captures the news. One cannot, for instance, escape the daily or even hourly updates on the Brexit saga. Those difficult negotiations on how to move from a EU member to a third country were simplified and summarized by the EU's chief negotiator, Michiel Barnier's PowerPoint slides. The most well-known one is this one. And is this is sarcastically described by the Brits as the steps of doom. This slide coincidentally summarizes also the main ingredients, all the main ingredients of the legal soup which the EU shares with third countries. However, in the shade of the Brexit limelight, the EU has been negotiating for some years with Switzerland, a novel institutional framework agreement with the purpose of updating the management of the so-called bilaterals, the EU-Swiss sectoral agreements. Also, the EU aims to modernize with the so-called European microstates, so Andorra, San Marino, and Monaco, its existing cooperation. And finally, the EU has developed ideas to update the EU-Turkey Customs Union, which, however, are currently shelved for political reasons. Today's topic is at the same time of long-lasting nature. It has since the beginning been part of the EU's external relations to conduct relations with neighboring countries, European neighboring countries. 
So has the EU concluded bilateral agreements with the after states, so the former or current non-EU member states cooperating with each other in a separate free trade organization, or countries aiming to join the EU in the future, so-called accession candidate countries like Turkey or the Western Balkan states. Thirdly, the integration of third countries into the European legal space also has a legal component. It is guided by law because it revolves around the question as to what constitutes the inner core of the supranational entity. How far can the EU extend supranational characteristics, namely directly effective norms, and the EU's substantial policies, customs union, internal market? Two third countries without blurring the distinction between members and non-members. Lastly, third countries' integration is highly political. The political climate impacts the legal design and the success of third country integration. The EU operates as the largest and most successful regional organization worldwide. It is equipped with a functioning customs union and internal market. It is further based on other more viable common aims such as common borders, currency, security and foreign policy. The EU, despite all its shortcomings, still acts in a, as an attractive role and rule model for other regional integration areas globally and third countries integrated into the so-called European legal space. This expression European legal space, coined by Christopher Harding some 18 years ago in his mapping exercise on legal regimes in Europe, denotes very well the impact of the EU's legal regimes in Europe. The extension of rules and regimes to its immediate neighbors forms part of the EU's ambition as a global rulemaker. Third countries align, either voluntarily or mandatory, to EU rules because these states want to join the Union in the future, trade with the Union, and import their products or services to the EU's internal market. The EU aims not to govern by stealth, but by law. It is a regulatory actor or soft power compared to nation states and superpowers. The EU, or global Europe, has a mission, and this is stated in Article 3, Paragraph 5 of the T Treaty on the European Union. In its relations with the wider world, it says there, the Union shall uphold and promote its values and interests and contribute to the protection of its citizens. This is twinned with Article 8 of the Treaty on the European Union concerning the wider European region. It aims to establish special relationship with neighboring countries founded on the values of the Union. These provisions flag that this organization is more than a trading bloc extending its rules. Its dogmatic self-understanding as a supranational legal order of constitutional nature was established from the beginning by the European Court of Justice. In the words of the European Court of Justice, formulated in the 2018 Achmea judgment and more recent than the Whiteman case on revoking Brexit, the, the court said the following, quote, EU law is characterized by the fact that it stems from an independent source of law, the treaties, by its primacy over the laws of the member states, and by the direct effect of a whole series of provisions which are applicable to their nationals and to the member states themselves. Those characteristics have given rise to a structured network of principles, rules and mutually interdependent legal relations binding the EU and its member states reciprocally and binding its member states to each other." End of quote. Consequently, the Union extends its regulatory model and its so-called structured network of rules and principles in different forms and under varying conditions, but without blurring the distinction between the supranational legal order and the international regime. Brussels rules are exported by unilateral EU legislation or bilateral multilateral agreements. The EU adopts with an extraterritorial reach or third country or EU adopts legislation with an extraterritorial reach or third countries voluntarily copy EU legislation. We witnessed recently many examples of this kind of extraterritorial reach. Look at the saving seals regulation or uh, the reach chemicals uh, regulation or data protection regulation. The union becomes a global rulemaker 
though in a clustered way, and many theories have dealt with the Brussels effect, norm diffusion, and territorial expansion to describe this development. Yet the most effective and structured approach to extend Brussels rules to third countries is by concluding uh, the conclusion of mutually binding international agreements. And this is achieved in a more effective and sustainable way in the nearer neighborhood than in the global arena. The focus of this presentation rests on countries in the Union's proximity, where the Union acts as an important regional rule maker. These countries either do not wish to join the EU for political project for diverse reasons, and instead aim to remain close, like Switzerland, the microstates Andorra, Monaco, San Marino, Vatican City, obviously, the EEA countries, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, or hold the ambition to join in the future and are candidate countries, the Western Balkan states, and also from the perspective of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine also aims for this accession. Or finally, they are countries whose status is unclear in transition. Britain is leaving, or not, we do not really know, so it's the kind of unclear status. And Turkey is a candidate country without currently a realistic accession perspective. These countries have an economic, financial, political, and strategic interest to participate in some of the EU's aims and objectives, but under their own terms, respecting their sovereign rights and specific interests. The landscape of third country integration is multifaceted. Some establish a customs union, so free movement of goods and a common commercial policy, with the European Union participating in the common commercial policy. The European microstates, for instance, and Turkey. Or from a free trade area, like the EU candidate countries, Western Balkan states. Other concepts provide for a tailor-made access to parts of the internal market, Switzerland, for instance, or offer the internal market with a so-called enhanced free trade area, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein under the European Economic Area. Or integration might include the possibility of access to the internal market in the future, Ukraine. In addition, and depending on the extent of their legal commitments, third countries align to the EU's so-called acquis communautaire, so the secondary rules of the EU, in some policy fields like Schengen, common borders, common foreign security policy, participate in EU programs like the education and training programs, euro currency even, like in the case of the microstates, or EU agencies, namely accession candidates and after countries. It is an integration by law which is clearly dominated by the EU institutions as the rule maker and the European Court of Justice as the rule shaper. The decision shaping influence of third countries in this process is minimal, as politicians and lawyers from the EFTA states have experienced with growing frustration. I will now illustrate the functioning of the European legal space, so how the EU consolidates its position as a regional rulemaker. Furthermore, I aim to explain why Theresa May's reference in her Florence speech in September uh, 2017 to the EU's creative arrangements with third countries is based on a wrong assumption. These arrangements are not creative, and this is not because lawyers lack imagination. They might do, but in this case, it's not the reason. It is caused by the building plan for the European legal space. The multifaceted purposes I mentioned earlier, customs union, free trade area, internal market, are related to the historical and specific context. Certain integration models were set up but have not necessarily proven to be sustainable in practice or compatible with the so-called judicial red lines set by the Court of Justice over the years. The so-called Norway, Swiss or Turkey models are not a free choice on the menu for a third country, except, and this is by default, the WTO model, the World Trade Organization trade rules, to which the EU and its member states are parties to uh, as separate members. Therefore, I will turn now to elucidate the legal building blocks the Union employs. Furthermore, I will highlight the three EU legal and political constraints that emerge when constructing a common legal space. And I finally will point out the hidden stumbling stones 
at the entrance into this space. In the 2012 communication on European microstates, the European Commission explained the underlying aims of third country integration. And these aims are in essence the same, irrespective of whether it concerns small Andorra or Great Britain. Internal market access can be provided under the conditions that mutual benefits through a level playing field and cooperation um, in support of shared objectives are safeguarded. This communication also decoded the applicable categories of cooperation which exist outside of membership in form of number one, sectoral agreements, number two, association agreements, number three, the EEA membership, and in parallel, and this I would like to add, membership in regional international organizations covering certain sectoral policies, such as aviation, energy, and transport. Let us take a closer look now at these building blocks. First, the sectoral agreements. Sectoral agreements provide tailor-made access to parts of the internal market, such as the area of movement of persons and goods, complemented by coverage of other internal market related policies, such as transport, competition, or Schengen rules, in separate international agreements. This piecemeal approach is visible in EU-Swiss relations, characterized by a patchwork of more than 120 sectoral agreements, the so-called bilaterals one and two, governed by 27 joint committees and a clustered variable dispute settlement system. While it achieves a tailor-made and flexible approach, this can be easily depicted as cherry-picking, the EU is frank about its stance. EU institutions have unanimously dismissed the Swiss experience in the last eight years for its unmanageable complexity and as being plagued by legal uncertainty. Consequently, the EU has promoted, without resonance, however, on the Swiss side, Swiss EEA membership, so European Economic Area, and at least a comprehensive framework association agreement. Since 2008, the EU has pursued to monitor the internal market related Swiss bilaterals by way of an overarching institutional framework agreement. This framework agreement has been negotiated since 2012. The draft finalized on a technical level at the end of 2018, however, holds a 50 to 50% chance to be signed and ratified. And I also heard this week because this was also the week of the Swiss hearings on this institutional framework agreement, which were obviously overshadowed by the, by the Brexit, um, that also here it's probably a lesser chance that these will be ratified. So it might disappear with less attention from the international press into the obscurity of internal Swiss politics. Yes, indeed, it sounds a little bit like the Brexit fudge. Then secondly, association agreements constitute a framework to establish a free trade area with preferential access to the internal market. Their flanking measures and horizontal policies provide a platform of participation in other areas of EU activities, common areas of interest. In the past, the formation of a customs union was only agreed exceptionally, as in the case of Turkey. Currently, association agreements of different generations are in place, with Turkey, the oldest one, and the Western Balkan states, more recent ones, which prepare for accession, so-called ac accession associations, and with countries of the Eastern partnerships, which do not prepare for accession, but also offer a pr perspective for legal approximation, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, and Georgia. As the association agreement with Ukraine, however, demonstrates, a deep and comprehensive free trade area might open the path for gradual integration into the EU internal market. This promise, based on preferential market access for goods, is conditional on the third country's successful legislation, legislative approximation to EU rules. Thirdly, EA participation, so participation in the European economic area. While this agreement is based on the association policy legal base, such as other association agreement, is, it is belonging to a separate category in terms of its structure, and institutional setup. The EEA extends the internal market on the EFTA states, so Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, 
Next, the extension, extension of these internal market policies, including the four freedoms, free movement of goods, persons, services, and capital. Um, the EA aligns competition and state aid rules with EU rules, but also the following horizontal policies, consumer protection, company law, environment, and social policy and statistics. The institutional framework of the EA is really unique because it consists two, of two pillars. The EU and its institutions constitute the first pillar, whereas the EA and EFTA bodies form the second pillar and mirror, mirror the EU institutions. Both legal orders are synchronized, and the EA pillar is safeguarded by EFTA surveillance authority, which copies that what the Commission does on the EU pillar level or the EU side, and an own court, the EFTA court. Finally, we have also regional organizations. Um, there are currently three bilateral or cooperation forms, which can be separate because they organize the sectoral approach and approximation. They operate in parallel to existing association agreements. The EU established with neighboring countries, so mainly with the Western Balkan states and the Eastern European neighborhood countries, an energy and a transport community, the transport community rather recently on, in 2017. Furthermore, a European common aviation area applies the EU's aviation key to the European economic area countries, accession candidates, and European neighborhood countries. These regional organizations extend EU rules in energy, aviation, and transport, but also related areas as environment, competition law, and public procurement. EU market access is here in this case conditional upon satisfactory implementation of this respective sectoral EU acquis. I would like to now move to the legal tools integrating third countries. For all these categories or building blocks, a toolbox of norms is designed to ensure an effective and coherent application of EU rules. These legal rules can be grouped for their twofold purpose in the European legal space. Number one, extending EU rules and ensuring their compliance. And number two, enforcing EU rules and safeguarding their consistent interpretation and development. Concrete examples from the three categories outlined can be traced back, for instance, um, the EC Swiss Agreement on Air Transport, the Association Agreement with Ukraine, the, the famous EEA Agreement, and the Transport Community Treaty recently. Uh, signed. To achieve a homogeneous legal space, rules phrased identically to respective EU rules, or referring to a concept or a key established under EU law. So in principle, if you want to extend the internal market, you also have to include similar norms as we know from the internal market freedoms in primary EU law. These are then extended and are introduced into these international agreements. They secure the extension, for instance, of the customs union, the internal market, or the Schengen rules, the common border, so rules to third countries. Furthermore, the contracting parties should aim for a homogeneous interpretation of the international agreement's provision with EU norms. In addition, the relevant rulings of the Court of Justice and even commission decisions, as it says in the Transport Community Treaty, are to be considered. These provisions are also directly effective Individuals can rely on them, and this is now clearly indicated in the more recent agreements, like Article 18 of the Transport Community Treaty. This differentiates these bilateral agreements from trade agreements updating WTO rules, which explicitly deny direct effect in national courts, like, for instance, the CETA, the FTA with Canada. The evolution of the interpretation of EU law norms and principles, which are extended on this third country, cannot, though, be reflected in these international agreements. The contracting party can only consider presidential case law decided before the signature of the agreement, and future developments of the case law are only communicated to the contracting party. Which brings us to the second point, enforcing EU rules and safeguarding their interpretation in this extended legal space. To prevent divergences in interpretation between these EU rules and the rules of these organizations or agreements in the European legal space on the long term, several models in different generations of international agreements exist. They can be generally split up in, number one, diplomatic resolution between the contracting parties, or adjudication by the Court of Justice, the EFTA Court, 
or even arbitrators or a combination, especially involving arbitrators and the Court of Justice. Enforcement mechanisms, the governance rules on state-to-state -state arbitration have become more sophisticated over the years. The development is related on the one hand um, to past experiences with ineffective diplomatic dispute resolution and on the other hand by the evolution of the Court of Justice jurisdiction in this area. By now, diplomatic conflict resolution has been overtaken by quasi-judicial resolution. The great variety, especially in the procedural details, is related to the respective generation, as mentioned, but also how far the agreement extends core policies of the EU to a third country, namely internal market, customs union, Schengen rules, currency. More novel agreements include a termination clause and allow for suspension measures in case irreconcilable divergences appear, like in the EA agreement or the common aviation area. This serves the purpose, strengthening the enforcement of the agreement and applying conditionality tools on the third country. To understand the evolution of these legal tools, I will now turn to the political and legal conditions framing the use of these building blocks. That's the cake, actually, which, uh, which the United Kingdom has to eat then at the end if they want to leave the European Union. Let's turn to these conditions, and I've illustrated them here. International agreements go governing the European legal space have evolved into a complicated legal design. They navigate a thin line between ensuring compliance with exported EU rules on the one hand and compliance with the EU and the third country's red lines in the year 2019 on the other. So what are these EU conditions framing every current and future third country integration? I will break them down as I, as I show on the slide into three criteria, EU competences, integrity and autonomy. These three criteria shape the building blocks of these international agreements. These conditions have been carved out more or less in the ECJ's jurisdiction but also mirrored in the current political negotiations. The essential characteristics or elements doctrines, conditions that the international agreement, according to the court, extending Brussels rules on third countries, cannot alter the so-called essential characteristics of the European Union. Essential elements, according to the court, are the existing power divide between the EU, its institution and member states, and that the international agreement does not affect the special legal order with its supranational principles. Finally, it requires that such an agreement does not touch upon tasks assigned to the national courts and the Court of Justice to apply and interpret EU law. Foreign judges on both sides, from the perspective of the EU and the third country, form an obstacle in current negotiations on third country participation in EU policies. In light of the complexity of this concept and its chameleonic character, I will distinguish between, before, before I go into these details, um, betw between three scenarios. However, only the last scenario is of relevance for my presentation. The first scenario relates to the EU's involvement in international dispute settlement beyond the borders of the European legal space. And the EU participates since 1994 in the WTO dispute settlement system and an increasing number of arbitration structures established on bilateral and multilateral uh, level, UNC tribunal also, and also other forms of arbitration structures. The bilateral agreements involving investor to state dispute in trade and investment agreements have in particular raised issues of compatibility with the EU legal order. The court's jurisdiction touched upon this situation until now only marginally. However, this could change with the currently pending case on the CETA agreement, the CETA agreement with Canada before the court and the, uh, the Advocate General will give its opinion in a few weeks, in one and a half weeks time. So this will be discussed and probably in more detail. The second scenario which we have to differentiate from this good settlement in, on the international uh, scope and arena is concerns the situation when the EU and or its member states participate in a specialized and autonomous dispute settlement system in the European legal space. And this was addressed actually quite frequently until now. 
in, uh, in the Court of Justice jurisdiction, like the Ahmea case on intra-EU investment disputes, the Patent Court opinion on the European Patent Protection System, and ECHR accession and the European Human Rights Protection. The EU and or its member states delegate or outsource specific judicial functions to an international organization and its court system, taking away this function from the Court of Justice and its member states' courts. The third and final scenario, which is relevant for today's presentation and my topic, is that the EU and third country establish a joint dispute settlement system through an international agreement to manage a common legal space. This situation has been assessed by the court in the so-called European Economic Area opinions, two of them, and the ECAA opinion, which was on the common aviation area. It appears to me more benevolent, uh, namely for this category, the Court of Justice until now has confirmed EU compliance in difference to the second scenario, which I just explained, because in this scenario, the court has consistently denied that there is EU compliance. But it is in practice of the comparable, in a comparable fashion, rigid as the case law addressed in the second scenario. However, and I would argue in contrast to the second scenario, it is rigid for a valid reason, namely preserving the EU's role and the role of its institution as a rule maker and not as a rule taker in relations to with smaller third countries in the neighborhood on which the EU rules are exported. I move now to these conditions outlined by EU jurisprudence and EU decision makers, which I can be identified in my view as formal conditions, a political condition and a judicial condition. The first is the EU competences, which is a formal condition. The this first condition on EU competences I will highlight only briefly since the EU court tends to apply a broad brush approach when considering it. The court focuses instead on its own role in the dispute settlement resolution in these agreements and the potential withdrawal of disputes under EU law, which falls under the autonomy of the courts and will be addressed under the third criterion. In principle, the court has said that you can participate in such international agreements and EU court's jurisdiction can be extended to third countries when EU competences are respected. Whether EU competences are affected is primarily a question of the intra-EU relation between EU and its member states and what the content of the international agreement regulates. Consequently, this is primarily assessed in light of its substantive content on dispute resolution and disputes on extended Brussels rules. The integrity and the second condition now, which is of relevance for the compliance of such agreements with EU law, is the integrity of EU law and creating a so-called level playing field. The integrity of EU law features prominently in the discussion on third country integration recently. Often narrowed down to the integrity of the internal market and the customs union, it has been, especially in the Brexit debate, more broadly interlinked with the integrity of the EU legal order and the autonomy of its decision making. The underlying understanding behind the integrity argument is more political than legal. The EU rules come with rights and obligations for third countries, but also that a dividing line between members and non-member states remains. This excludes third countries from gaining equal rights in EU institutions or having a free choice as to which EU integration policies they join in. It is reflected in the Brexit negotiations when references to the long-term relations are made. The European Council stresses a balance of rights and obligation, the preservation of a level playing field and the integrity and proper functioning of the, inter of the internal or single market. In the words of the European Council President Donald Tusk, no rights of Norway with the obligation of Canada or st staying true to the food, food allegory having the cake and eating it and getting a smile from the baker, or in this case, from Donald Tusk. This is in principle not what is allowed. Behind this integrity condition looms the economic and political consideration of securing a level playing field, fair and equal conditions for traders are quite early present in the internal policies, internal market and competition, 
and frequent references to the external dimension can be traced back uh, since 2010. Thus, if third countries, their citizens and businesses profit from EU rules and freely trade with the Union, its citizens and businesses, they should play along with the rules and including the EU's social values and environmental concerns. The dreams of some hardline Brexiteers of a Singapore off the shore are for the European Union and Brussels the worst nightmare. This concern is also nourished by the Swiss ghost haunting the European Union. This alludes to the underlying premise that the Swiss have profited from staying outside, or at least have suffered no disadvantages, which has been attributed to the Swiss cherry picking. Concrete examples of throwing this level playing field off balance have arisen. Switzerland has been able, since 2004, to differentiate between EU citizens from existing and new member states, to keep restriction on the job market in place. Besides, posted workers have fallen since 2004 under the so-called Swiss flanking measures to protect Swiss labor conditions, namely the compliance with minimum wages, and an eight days rule applies according to which EU companies need to register with the Swiss authorities eight days in advance before providing services. This unequal treatment might be legal ex legally acceptable, but it's difficult to justify and undermines the level playing field, especially from the perspective of EU citizens. Let's move on to the last criterion, the autonomy. Autonomy of EU courts and EU judges has become an overarching condition. It has decisively contributed to the judification and standardization of bilateral compliance control and dispute settlement. However, as a condition, it has been erratic and ever evolving. In the beginning, the focus rested on the union's competences and the functioning of the common policies. In the first cases, especially in follow-up case law, the goal of the court of justice in its international dispute settlement became the point of contestation. So in several opinions and even broadened lately to member states courts being linked with the union in a network of principles and rules. While a lot has been written in literature about these essential characteristics and what the inner core of judicial autonomy entails, it boils down to two readings. The Court of Justice has the interpretation monopoly over EU law and its related international norms, norms which form the European legal space and which are extended on the third country through an international agreement. And secondly, EU law disputes cannot be withdrawn from the jurisdiction of the member state courts and the European Court of Justice. These judicial conditions can be defended, as I earlier explained, but limits have to be established. When the Union extends EU law to third countries, to, into a European legal space, then the ECJ can insist of remaining the final arbiter of these EU rules and the related rules. This also serves the purpose of protecting EU competences and the level, level playing field I discussed earlier. So far, the Court of Justice has approved two forms of dispute settlement for the European legal space. The one pillar system of the special common aviation area, where the Court of Justice gives the final verdict on the application and interpretation of the agreement, or the two pillar system of the European economic area, with the after court ruling for the EA after members. The third and most recent system uh, containing an arbitration mechanism in combination with the ECJ has operated until now underneath the judicial radar. This might point into the direction of the most feasible solution for future bilateral deals outside the EEA. This dispute settlement system was introduced, dispute settlement possibility of an arbitration, uh, arbitrators uh, was introduced in the association agreement with Ukraine and has been followed in the UK. So you find it also in the UK draft withdrawal agreement for this transitional time and the draft institutional framework agreement with Switzerland, which was also a few weeks ago, ago uh, on the technical level agreed among the negotiators. Conflicts are not settled by a diplomatic body, but by an appointed arbitration panel under procedural conditions, review mechanisms, 
and remedies for non-compliance. However, the arbitration mechanism has no mandate to decide questions on EU law or concept of EU law. These questions have to be referred to the Court of Justice. Let's come to the re concluding remarks. At the beginning, I stated I would not address food literally. That was not totally true. I will brief briefly explain now why since the last few years, you find in the yogurt section of your local supermarket this superfood. Um, this is called shkir, and it's, it's, it's of Icelandic origin. This is explained by third country integration. Iceland profits from free movement of goods under the EA regime, with the exception of agriculture and fishery products, because this is uh, sensitive for this country and they don't want to fall this under the free movement rights. So skier or, or skier could not be imported freely um, to the European Union. However, recently, there is a recent agreement between the EU and Iceland. We have now duty-free quotas have been introduced and this makes it possible that skier and more skier from Iceland and not from Sweden, because this one is from Sweden, will enter. <laughs> will enter the European market, the real one, I, but supposedly. So this is at least something which has an influence and uh, will change because the quotas have been extended. Skier, by the way, is, is, is a cheese which is categorized as a yogurt, if you didn't know this. But it's also an apt allegory for this topic. Why? Because third countries in the proximity of the Union struggle finding their spot, being half in and half out. However, also the EU is challenged by tailor-made integration of third countries. The road to the EU regulatory space is paved with stumbling stones. These are well-known ones, such as the Irish border, or lesser-known ones as the flinking, uh, Swiss flanking measures. Third country integration is organized around legal building blocks which have been refined over the years to fit the legal and political conditions established by the EU rule makers and EU rule shapers. The three legal and political constraints demand that the extension of EU or Brussels rules does not result in disadvantages for EU business and citizens, the level playing field. The court ex extensive reading of the EU's autonomy establishes the precondition that the interpretation of EU law and its development is determined only by the Court of Justice. It restricts the involvement of other forms of arbitration in courts, so foreign judges for the European Court and for the European Union. Hence, the demanding technical task for the general public difficult to comprehend and utterly boring emerges as to how to recognize which international agreements provisions are of EU law origin and which are not. This requires first a clear-cut categorization as to how far the EU extends the core characteristics of the EU legal order in form of internal market or customs union. Secondly, any agreement extending Brussels rules also needs to determine in great technical detail the circumstances, circumstances under which a European Court of Justice reference is required. This latter aspect is partially reflected also in these draft agreements on the Swiss and the British side, but still might result in, in disputes if they ever get ratified in the form they are in, in the current form. Finally, these in integration models have, been, have to be sustainable. Once they have survived the negotiation and ratification phase, while the EA has fared better than other forms of bilateralism and sectoral multilateral, multi multilateralism until now, the EA, so the e European Economic Area, also struggles to keep pace. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the adoption of the EU Citizenship Directive without a parallel concept of citizenship in the EA system poses legal challenges. Other forms of cooperation have become outdated. Turkey, the Turkey Association and the cooperation with the microstates, or too complex and static like the Swiss model, or have not yet proven whether they will fulfill their potential to achieve sect sectoral legal approximation, like the European Common Aviation Area, the energy and transport community. Finally, I would like to say a few words on my research agenda. This chair is devoted to EU external relations law. 
which has been the focus of my research since my PhD, so over a lot of years. <laughs> we all witness a specialization of EU law. The discipline compartmentalizes into such sub-disciplines as EU social security law, EU media law, EU food law, EU migration law. This is a comforting sign of maturity for this supranational legal order, but comes as a risk or with a risk of losing oversight. In the end, however, most of these strands come together again in these specialized disciplines. This can be demonstrated in EU external relations law, my field. This discipline has an institutional dimension which touches upon the core issues of EU institutional law, competences, institutional principles, legal review, and substantive policies. All internal policies have gained an external dimension, the external dimension of the internal market or the area of freedom, security, and justice, to mention only two. This consequently necessitates an understanding of the internal setup of such policies. My research aims to cover in the upcoming years the interconnection between the internal and external dimension of the EU policies by focusing to cherry pick one on the external dimension of EU administrative law. It is embedded in an extensive network of external relations experts who have been connected through the CLEAR network, conferences, summer schools, and other collaboration. And I'm so happy to see so many of you here. This is very nice to see. I'm very happy to see that. I would like to express my gratitude to all of these excellent lawyers from practice and academe who have been collaborating with my, me, and especially also my colleagues, in the various EU external relations projects outside and inside the CLEAR framework and family. And we just had celebrated our 10 years anniversary a few weeks ago. Thanks to all of you, external relations law has been tremendously fascinating and intellectually stimulating field of research, sometimes also mind-boggling, I have to say. So I would also like to th thank um, and take the opportunity to thank Johan von Haarsalter, I already saw him, for having the courage to hire me uh, for the Asso Institute and the Hague some 20 years ago, hiring me in working actually in the field of WTO law. At that time, we thought we, we could work in that field. And uh, we tried, and also Wiebe Daumann was hired for that reason. But at the end, we ended up working on a EU enlargement and on, in the Asa College Europe, teaching young lawyers and traveling to almost every corner in Central and Eastern Europe. This was extremely rewarding experience, and I just got the other day a proud email from one of my former students 19 years ago, a Hungarian lawyer, who proudly told me that he represented his first case before the Court of Justice. And he said it was thanks to, to me that I, but I don't think he could use what I taught him 20 years ago, so <laughs> I don't think that was. Furthermore, I would like to thank the current and former Dean of the Law fac Faculty, Hildegard Schneider and Jan Smits, um, the NVO, and the committee member who appointed me. I would also like to thank uh, the former and the cur current uh, head of my department, Monika Klaas and Alan Foss, in their work, and above all, also the colleagues at my department, International European Law. It is above all a great pressure, pleasure in working with you. It is not a pressure, it is a pleasure. <laughs> It could be also impression, pressure to keep up with you, and you have also so many uh, ideas and, and conferences, so this is uh, inspiring to have so many people working on EU law in Maastricht. This is, uh, this is a very, very great privilege for us at this faculty. In addition, I've been enjoying working together with my colleagues from FASOS. In many years of teaching some of your courses, or one of your courses, I'm looking forward also to more research collaborations with you. Let me also especially mention my colleagues, again, Alan Foss and Bruno de Witte and Anne-Peter van der Meij and Alf Willem Heringer, because they also work with me on various research, editing and teaching activities. Your expertise, skills and enthusiasm are motivation and guiding example for me. Maybe too much Gründlichkeit, but I try to improve this. Thanks to students and supervisees who bear with me over the years, I learn from you as much as I hope Fully, you learn from me. Before I finish, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to my family, Alex, Annika. Annika really was, uh, I forgot her reading materials, so uh, she did it very well. Thank you for staying so long patiently in your, almost patiently. And my friends, I also, also especially would like to thank for 
being a caring, supportive, and spicing up my life with humor. Ik heb gezegd. Dear Professor or dear Andrea, thank you so much for what I think was a very rich and very insightful inaugural address. I don't think I exaggerated when I used the word Grundlichkeit. Eh? You referred to it a few times, but I think it, you've had so many uh, insights that will give us uh, more time to reflect upon also in this, this weekend on a highly topical uh, theme. Um, you, at some point in your inaugural, you mentioned that lawyers might not be having so much imagination. Eh? You heard also people laughing a little bit. I tend to disagree with you. I'm not sure if the founders of the EU ever thought of this whole framework of rules and, and mechanisms and dispute resolution uh, mechanisms to this entire field of EU external laws. I think you need lots of imagination uh, to be able to do that. You also show that by the presentation of your slides and the way that you also presented your inaugural address with lots of passion. I also understand why you are uh, always evaluated as a very good teacher in the European Law School, which always gets uh, very high estimations of our students. So thank you very much. I also would like to give you some details from the boardroom when you talk about imagination and lawyers. I'm a lawyer myself. Huh? And uh, when Jan and I are, uh, and with uh, the other deans, have to make new policies and new rules, we don't like to be binded or bound too much eh, by these rules. So Jan at some point said, let's add the wording in principle. And what do we do now? Almost every time when there's a new policy framework, we add in principle. And the other deans really love it. I think you do it now in your faculties as well. So we like to give space to our academics by doing that. So I think lawyers are really very, very much creative and have a lot of imagination. You also scared me a little bit, by the way. I uh, once taught European law to first year students when I was 20 under the supervision of Professor Schenden from Utrecht, also present here. I need a fundamental new uh, refreshment course. Uh, that, that's for sure. So you kind of scared me too there. I've said enough. I would like to thank our audience for being here, your beautiful daughter for being so quiet, and your mother even for getting your reading material. Oh, but that's not Grundlichkeit, Andrea. What happened there? Uh, but you did very well. Heel goed gedaan. I would also like to uh, give a special word of thanks to our regional minister, Dr. Joost van der Akker, present here also on the first row. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And of course, also our colleagues from abroad. Abroad sounds like, I mean, outside Limburg. Uh, it does still, <laughs> it still feels a little bit like this foreign country here. But I mean, thank you so much for taking the time and the effort to come to uh, this ceremony, very much appreciated. We now uh, go to the reception uh, room where you can congratulate our newly appointed professor. Uh, I always say that you should really enter the room, don't stay in the corridor because it's very cold there. Take a drink and find your moment to congratulate her. So thank you very much and this is the end of the ceremony. <laughs>